morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. To God be the glory. For he has done great things. He has done great things. And he's still doing great things. Don't be don't don't get it twisted now. He's still doing great things in the lives of his people. Every one of us, he's doing something right now that's going to change the trajectory of your life right now. Right now because you belong to him. Too often we get it all mixed up of who we really belong to. Who we who we wake up and thank God for a new day. Who we 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 thank him for how he does the things that he does in our lives. We get distracted. We get mixed up. But God is true to his word. He's so true to his word. Today, we're going to be looking at some texts from Matthew. Uh, the topic of today's sermon is going to be obey God. Keep it moving. Obey God and keep it moving. Obey God and keep it moving. Keep it moving. Keep it moving. We're going to Matthew, the 10th chapter. We're going to look at verses 1 through 14 and some other verses. Even 10, 10th chapter, 1 through 43. Really, if I can get all the way to the end to show you the then and the now of this text. We also, uh, TSM, you don't have this. We're going to go to Luke 5, 17 through 32. This was given to me um, after I had already submitted my script. So as I was reviewing it in the wee hours of this morning, this came to me. So I'm going to go ahead and release it, and I'm going to do what God said. What, what, obey God and keep it moving. It may look like it's mixed, but it, mm -mm. obey God and keep it moving. Let's pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you at this hour to say thank you. Father God, we thank you for all that you've done for each and every one of us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for everybody present here today in the sanctuary and for those who are online. Lord God, we thank you. Thank you for their obedience, Lord God, to show up. Thank you, Lord God, for their obedience, Lord God, to be hungry for your word. So have your way on this day, Lord God. Do what you've intended to do. Speak through me and for me, Lord God, that your word will come forth with clarity, Lord God, that even the youngest child, Lord God, on the other side of the, the, the TV screen or the other side of, of the listening device or, or in the sanctuary even, Lord God, can understand what your will and way is with the word. So, Father God, have your way, Lord God. Let them see all of you, Lord God, and none of me. Just have your way, Lord God. Have your way, Lord God. These and all blessings we ask in the precious name of Jesus we pray. And we all said amen, amen, and amen. Obey God and keep it moving. Obey God and keep it moving. Two texts have been selected as key verses only because I'm going to jump back to those verses, uh, one at the end and one in the middle. I'm going to talk a little bit about it. The first one is uh, the 10th chapter, verse 14. It says, if anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off of your feet. Key verses number of Matthew 28, 19 through 20. At the end, I'm going to try to tie that into the sermon which is all about, it's all coming together. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. That speaks volumes, doesn't it? That's the Great Commission if you didn't recognize it. That is the Great Commission. And all of us have the responsibility of that Great Commission. Okay, well, now remember that. Sometimes, you know what? We got to see the end before we even continue with where we're at or with the, even the beginning. We're so focused on the beginning. Sometimes, even now, we know as Christians, as children of God, we know what our end's going to be, don't we? Oh, yes, don't we know what salvation is all about, don't we? And every time we mount this pulpit, that is the number one goal is to find a lost soul, to say something to quicken that dimmer of a spirit on the inside of them, that they will come forth and say, Lord, what must I do to be saved? So know that. It's an ultimate, ultimate, ultimate task for each and every one of us. That's an assignment because we are what? Disciples of Christ. <clears throat> Truly, God is so amazing. He's moving mightily in miraculous ways and constantly shaking and moving the lives of his people. He keeps showing up and showing out for us. All the time, every week, week in, in, in and out, I'm getting testimonies of this miraculous work that he's doing. He's just going places and doing things and people telling me stuff. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. And I then one lady even emailed me something. She, te she didn't text it. She emailed it to me. And, and she was working from headquarters. And I'm like, oh, my goodness. What? else can God do for everybody? What else? I mean, just if you just tap in to who Christ is in your life, you will be ringing somebody's phone or you will be calling somebody up. Or you will be texting somebody or you will be emailing somebody and you will be talking about it because you know God was all about it for you. He showed up for you. He did not push you aside. He did not say, wait a minute, get in line. It's not your turn. When it's your turn, it's your turn. Nobody can jump in line in front of you like the lunch line. Nobody can jump in line in front of you like at the store when the lines are long. When it's your turn, it's your turn. When it's your time, it's your time. Understand that. Understand that. We've got to obey God and keep it moving. Keep it moving. Don't get distracted. Don't get distracted. He keeps showing up, showing up, showing up. Matthew 10, 143 is what I told you we're going to be focusing on. We're going to also look at that key verse 14 when I get to it. We're also going to be looking at Luke 5. 17 through 32 from the uh, NIV, and the TSM does not have that, so I, that probably won't come up on the screen. But we're going to look at all these verses, and I want you to understand, when God makes things happen, we are in awe. He keeps us in wonder, what's next? How's he going to work this out? Oh, this is too big for him. I know. I, I, mm -mm. I don't think this is something he can solve. I got to go and get another resource, or I got to do this or do that. But no, he keeps showing up. Just like we teach our kids certain things over and over again, the basic principles of life, it doesn't matter how old they are or at what level of life's journey they are at, some things just don't change that you've taught them. Some things are the foundational development of their growth. Some things that you've taught them at an early age, 
they will continue with those thoughts throughout their eternal life on this earth and eternity. They will remember these things when they are farthest away from you. So don't think that discipleship just goes away with the Bible. Because even at home, discipleship is there. We're teaching our children to be disciplined to the things that we've taught them to get them on the right path of life. We teach them and, and, and we've discipled them in the home to do the right thing. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Yeah, you can repeat that. Tell it to your neighbor. Right is right and wrong is wrong. Right is right and wrong is wrong. It's no straddling the fence on that. Ain't no, it's, it's no gray area. That's true. I got that even written. It's no gray area. I have that written up here. No gray area. Nobody can bend it. Nobody can break it. It's right or it's wrong. It's no straddling the fence. It's no lukewarm. It is everything that it is, right or wrong. This book of gospel, this gospel book of Matthew, is the first book of the New Testament, and it gives us the story of how Jesus comes to his disciples, I mean to his people, but he's rejected by them, and after the resurrection, he sends his disciples to the Gentiles. There are miracles in this, in this uh, gospel, and there are parables in this gospel. Matthew's gospel is viewed as the most important by the early church. It's directed primarily to the Jewish people, and at least 130 direct references to the Old Testament have been identified. It also shows Jesus as the messianic king of the Old Testament prophecy. See, I'm trying to give you a little bit of history to bring you up. Unique features, and some of you already know this because we got many scholars here at Victory Chapel. Praise God for that, many scholars. 644 contain words of Jesus, okay? And 35 are parables. It records about 20 of Jesus' miracles, and three are found only in Matthew's gospel. It presents him as the king and as a servant. Research the historical part of the scriptures every Sunday when we have a message. Go home when your Bible study time during the week, just pick it up and see if you can find some of the historical texts on it and just, it just brings everything else together like pieces to a puzzle. I've always liked history, so I just tend to like to go in that direction. And this is how our spirits are cultivated. We read the word, we study the word. It's, it cultivates us to become the disciples that Christ would have us to be. Slide three, it goes Matthew 10, 1 through 4. Jesus called his 12 disciples to him, and he gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the 12 apostles first, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, put a pin there, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. A disciple is considered as a learner. Each and every one of us under the sound of my voice is a learner. We are all disciples. Disciple is used in the Bible because we are studiers of, of God's word. 
we study his word, we are disciples. We are learners of his word. Apostles are usually a sent messenger that has authority that has been imparted on them. So you see how he's moved it to these are the names of the 12 apostles. He uses the word called. Jesus called his 12 disciples. Called, God can call anybody that he chooses to call. We all have regular duties as uh, disciples of Christ, but there are times when he has chosen people for a particular task, for a particular people, for a particular region, for a particular mission. Okay, we are all on mission fields every day, but you and I know that there are people who actually have missions fields that they go on for their churches. They go overseas. They do a lot. One of the ministries I came from, um, they, they do a mega, mega ministry of missions all over the world. So missions, they, they have missions that they're trying to, to, to take care of. Despite what your history might be, despite what you've been through in life, just answer and don't be analytical to wonder how you're going to do the assignment when God calls you for a particular assignment. Just answer. Too many times we don't answer. For one reason or another. You may get a call from someone saying, we would like for you to go on the missions field. You got selected. Oh, what, what day is it of the week? What, when, what, when is it supposed to be? What week is that? Oh, I don't know. That's the week that I'm, I usually go to that concert with the folk. I don't, I don't think I can go. How did you select me for the missions field anyway? I mean, what? What? How did I, how did I get, how did you? Uh -uh. First of all, when something like that happens and you don't know why you were sec selected for the missions field, understand God's about to do something. Don't turn down your opportunity because you have some concert that you've been going to every year, hearing the same old songs from the same old artists, the same people going on, the stuff, they're going to drop it like it's hot, and they're going to do all this, and they're going to bump it to the rump and whatever. If my kids were here, they would say, oh, no. Mama, please, you know you don't know them words you're saying. You don't even know what you're saying. Don't try to get into that territory of repeating words you don't know nothing about because you're going to say something and that don't, don't. But this is what happens. In transparency, transparency with the word, that's what happens. Because first of all, you're going to get called when you least expect it. Whether you're prepared and prayed up and, and worded up and girded up and you got the whole armor of God on and you're ready. But that call is going to come at a time when you will be challenged. At a time when you will have to say, is it going to be this or is it going to be that? God is growing us up in many different ways. We are in a period of time right now where things are happening. Things are happening that we've never seen before in our life. Things in this world have changed so much until people are just going with the flow. Some of them are just going with the flow. They're not trying to, you know, say what's right or stand up for right. They're just going with the flow. But God has strategically placed his disciples where they're supposed to be. And you need to show up when you are called. Just answer. Answer your call that Christ, when he calls you, answer your call. 
You're the first thing, oh, I don't know how to do that. I don't, I don't know how to go. I can remember I was selected to go on the missions field to New York. And I was like, wow. Don't you know that your leaders are going to train you up before they send you out? You may be prayed up and worded up and girded up with the whole armor of God, but there are strategically things placed in place that you have to learn before you go into unknown territory. The fact that you're prayed up and you know God, that is great. That's what the first prerequisite is. Know God, you love God, you're saved, you understand your salvation so you can share it with somebody else. But as a disciple of Christ, you also got to understand there are other learning avenues that you have to take when you're sent out on the missions field. Don't you know that the disciples were called? been around him sometime you know they, they were called look let's let's read this a little further just answer don't be so analytical about it about how everything's going to work out you know God works everything out for your good your background or your bio or your resume of sins qualify you for the job your resume of sins qualify you for the job you got a whole resume of sins that don't nobody know about but you and Jesus. Jesus, some people have took their sins to the grave and you just finding out about them afterwards. Years later, you find out that something went on. But God, and even if you find out later, guess what? It had to happen. When you look at the dynamics of the puzzle, the puzzle had to fit. It had to happen. You had to show up. Those sins qualify you for the job. See, what Satan meant for bad, God always turns it around for good. And a lot of you, under the sound of my voice, you already know that you can raise your hand and attest to that. What you thought you were disqualified for by set you up for qualification. It was a, it was, it was a setup. See, it, it, it was meant for you to stay in that hole, that dark hole that you put yourself in. You were in a hole of despair. You were, you were in a hole of loss, being lost. It all qualified you for the job that God has for you. To reach the lost, to reach the lonely, to reach somebody where you have only gone that nobody knows about. But yet and still, Satan has it set up where it makes you go into a dark place, where you go and inhabit your house, and you go somewhere, and you become a hermit in your own house. You set yourself up away from everybody else. You don't even want to go out. You, you just take yourself out of the equation. Because you're having a moment, an emotional moment, a distressful moment, thinking that, oh, gosh, I don't have any reason to go further. I'm just going to stay where I'm at. People live these type of thoughts all the time. People live these thoughts. And, and you go, but, but at the end of the day, guess what? That's what qualifies you to reach somebody. That's what qualifies you to be a true disciple of Christ. That's what qualifies you. But God, but God, he can quicken your spirit and qualify your soul. A soul that has been tattered and torn. A soul that has been severed. A soul that has been broken down. Broken down to the point where you have what's called a soul ache. Soul aches are aches that only the person who's aching can relate about it. If you've ever had a soul ache, you know what I'm talking about. I don't care who you are. If you've ever had a soul ache, it's a soul ache. It's an ache of despair that rips on the inside of you. It's an ache of despair that hurts from the core. It's an ache of despair that nobody knows about but you. It's an ache of despair that you sing yourself to sleep at night. It's
it's an ache of despair that you talk to God about it over and over. God, did you forgive me for my sins? God, did you, why is my soul aching so bad? God. A soul that's been severed, a soul that's been broken down, left for useless, left for nothing, left for nobody. A soul, a soul that aches when life has been ripped from its core of living, when life has been stricken with medical issues, when life has been traumatized by the ways of the world and the unmerited wants of mankind against their fellow brothers and sisters. A soul ache. But God, who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross for our sins, that we could accept him as our savior and have eternal life. Lord God, I thank you from saving me from the pits of hell. I thank you, Lord God, for saving me from the depths of darkness. No sin can shake my destiny. No sin can hold my feet. No sin can hold my hands. No sin can hold my tongue. Nothing but the grace of God but the grace of God. God is true to his word. Nothing can hold you bound as a disciple of Christ. You may think you're going to be down for a while. But when God works this thing out, he takes places to he takes people to places where they didn't even think they could go. The word of God will take you further than anybody else on this earth can take you. The word of God will allow you to leap over the hurdles of life that you thought you could not rise high above. The word of God will just give you and rescue and bask you in his love and you know from a shadow of, from a shadow of a doubt that it's God. It's not your sister or brother that brought you out of this. Uh-uh, not your sister or brother. God. God. And like I said, he shows up. He calls these disciples, and he gives them some instructions. But he shows up. He shows up. He shows up. I'm going to share a nugget of knowledge about the disciple, one of the disciples that was called. This sort of changed this sermon a little bit, and I know I don't have time to get everything in that I would love to get in, everything on here. But let's go to this text. It's Luke, and I'm going to read it. I know you're all very familiar with it. It's Luke 5, 17 through 26. It starts reading as thus. One day Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees and teachers of the law were sitting there. They had come from every village of Galilee and from Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was with Jesus to heal the sick. Some men carrying a paralyzed man on a mat and tried to take him into the house to lay him before Jesus. When they could not find a way to do this because of the crowd, they went up on the roof and lowered him on his mat through the tiles into the middle of the crowd, right in front of Jesus. When Jesus saw their faith, he said, Friend, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law began thinking to themselves, who is this fellow who speaks blasphemy, who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knew that they were think what they were thinking, and he asked, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Stop right there for a moment. Don't you know Jesus knows everything you're thinking about in your heart? 
your qualifications, your disqualifications, your everything. Don't you know God already knows every sin that you've committed, everything that you've gone through, every wayward person that you decided not to talk to? You'll get that later. Because that's an assignment. There are people that you've been assigned to that are wayward that you need to say something that's going to bring them into the fold. That's, that, that they're your assignment. I couldn't go and say the same thing. Only you can say it because it's your assignment. Jesus says, why are you thinking these things in your hearts? Which is easier? To say, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He's got the authority. He's got the authority. So he said to the paralyzed man, I tell you, get up and take your mat and go home. Immediately he stood up in front of them took what he had been lying on, and went home praising God. Everyone was amazed and gave praise to God. They were filled with awe and said, we have seen remarkable things today. Now in the next verse, he speaks to Levi. Does everybody know who Levi is? Jesus calls Levi and eats with sinners. Let's read. It says, after this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector by the name of Levi sitting at his tax booth. Okay? Follow me, Jesus said to him. And Levi got up and left everything and followed him. Let's put a pin there. Did Levi question him? Did Levi say anything about, well, look, I'm leaving behind my family. I got stuff to do. My kids are about to graduate. My this, that. I got to go this. I got to, my husband needs me for this, and I got to do this. I got this to do on the job. I got this. It didn't give us any details of any of those excuses or whining and complaining. He got up. He left everything and he followed him. Then Levi held a great banquet for Jesus at his house. And a large crowd of tax collectors and others were eating with them. Let's put a pen right there. You know, the tax collectors back in the day, they were like bad business, okay? Historical part about it was that, you know, they could take some of your money or whatever, or up your rate, and so they could have some more money and all this kind of stuff. So they were considered people that were like, you know, sinners for real, for real. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who belonged to their sect complained to his disciples, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? They asked Jesus, why? Why are you coming here eating with us? supping with us and doing whatever with us. Have you ever questioned yourself when you got invited to a party that was somebody that may be a little bit off the chain, you know what I'm saying, and you were surprised you got the invitation? And you were like, oh, gosh, should I go? I know they're going to be doing this, that, and the other there. They're probably going to have a lot of liquor, and I, you know I don't drink. I mean, they're going to be saying, take a drink and take a drink and do this and do that and all this stuff. I mean, you... You can go to dinner with somebody and they'll have you have a little glass of wine and you're not accustomed to wine and guess what? You go on, be social and drink it and you be looking around like, oh my goodness, I'm getting a little woozy now. What is going on? Trying to be social, putting yourself in a bad situation. Been there, done that. It's in college. Got to invite to dinner. Oh, okay. Went out to dinner, fancy restaurant, white tablecloths, all the good stuff. Um, have some wine. Oh, I don't drink. 
oh, you can have just a little smidgen of white wine. It's okay. It, that, that doesn't hurt. It's okay. Go ahead. I'm like, okay, you know, you know, this is for you to have kids in high, I mean, out of co in college and they're off away from home or out of state and doing whatever. Okay, have a little taste. Okay, okay. Little taste. I could smell the wine when it got to my nose. I'm like, ooh, they must, this must be strong. I don't know, you know. Smell a little bit of it, sip a little bit, put it down in there. Oh, before I take you home, I need to stop by to pick up something at the house or something and just sit right here for a second. I go tiptoeing in the house looking around. I'm like, really? What in the world? Then he's like, oh, come on. I was like, oh, no, 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 no. He's like, come on, girl. Let's go. Let's do this. Chasing me around a table. Thank God I'm a country girl. I can feed for myself. I used to cut wood with an axe. Tracy, you know, we used to cut some wood back in the day. I was strong enough to fiend for myself, and I bet you, guess what? He probably ain't tried it with nobody no more. Not with me anyway. I didn't go out with them anymore. But I'm saying all of this to say, why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus answered them, it's not the healthy who need a doctor. But the sick, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners unto repentance. So understand that when you have a call and God calls you to do an assignment that you may not be uh, 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 encouraged to do or have the knowledge to do, just do what God is asking you to do. Go ahead and just answer the call. No, the point number one was know your authority in Christ. We are to carry out the purposes of God in advancing the kingdom, healing the sick, and defeating the works of Satan. Authority is the power that's given over to something, particularly that gives you orders, the right to do certain things at certain times. We know that people at, at, on our jobs have been given the authority to give us assignments and stuff like this. But in this text, God has given them authority to go out, to seek those who need help, who are, need healing and all this stuff. He has imparted them with this authority. It's showed in the next word, verse how they are apostles assignments they're on assignment and when this happens we should go ahead and take the notes to know that God has a reason for us to be on assignment take your assignment and enjoy your assignment know that God has a plan for you he knew Levi as well as all the other disciples Levi was Matthew, as you see in the beginning where he talks about who the disciples are, he says in that text, in, in the verse, he describes who Levi was. He says the tax, uh, Matthew was, he says the tax collector. So that's Levi. Levi, and that's another thing. God has given us names. He knows the names of everybody. He knows what your history has been. He knows what you've been through. He knows everything about us. And so therefore, when you get the call, just go ahead and answer. Answer for Jesus. He doesn't hold any of your things that you thought disqualified you as a disciple of Christ. He holds those things as a major qualification. Let's go on to read the fact that point number two was he knows your name. He knew Levi as well as all the other disciples, but he called them because they were, they were qualified for the assignments. He, he knew what their history was. He knew all about them and the things that they had done. So understand that when we go to verse um, 5, it says, These 12 disciples were sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely you give. God, point number three was follow God's instructions. 
Whatever he has, he has a route for you to take. He has assignments for you to do. Follow those instructions. Good. Point number four was go where God tells you to go to proclaim the gospel. Don't think that you are not capable of proclaiming the gospel. It doesn't matter if it's at a small church or a small group setting. If you're asked to participate and do something along those lines to bring the word or whatever it is that God has imparted in you to take to that group of people, do it. Because God has you on assignment. Just do what he says and keep it moving. Obey God and keep it moving. Too often we ask too many questions or get too analytical with everything. We've got to get it in our spirits that we're going to obey God and we're going to keep it moving. And it goes on to say, do not get any gold or silver or copper to take with you in your belts. He says, no bag for the journey or extra shirt or sandals or staff, for the worker is worth his keep. He tells them distinctly. He gives them specific orders on what to do. And when you are sent out on the mission field, you will be given specific or, um, orders as to what to do. Even as a disciple, you're given specific orders as what to do. Have you noticed that sometimes there are certain things or that you just choose not to wear on a certain day because you're going somewhere? There's some feeling on the inside, oh, don't, don't put that on. That just don't feel right. You know, my husband can't understand. Why is it that you can't just line up all your clothes in the closet and just go in there one day, take this outfit, and just put it on and go? It doesn't matter what, what the color is or what it is or what. Why do you have to worry about, oh, do I feel like wearing this? I just, it's a feeling. It's something about a feeling. It's something about how you feel. And then when you get to where you're going, it answers. You say, mm, and now I see why I didn't need to have on that. Because I, my assignment required me to bend down, to do this, to do that, to do whatever. But God still lets you know it's in your spirit that he talks to you. So when you get these inklings, don't just push them aside. Know God is up to something. Wear what God is telling you to wear. But the reason why he told them not to wear these certain things because he didn't want them to appear as if they were uh, going to work because they were on assignment. They were going out to win souls, to talk about Jesus uh, wherever they were sent, to talk about Jesus so, and, to, and, to, and to bring people into the fold. So even when you're going on a missions field, there are certain things that you can't wear or take or what you should take. Even, even those of you who participated with prison ministry, we know that there are certain things that we cannot wear into the facilities. There are certain, uh, um, dress, there's a certain dress code for going, and you understand, you know you're there for assignment. But there are certain things, you know, your arms, even in, in many different things. Your arms shouldn't be out and all this, just various little things that, that go on. But there's a reason for all of this. So don't be quick to be upset when you are uh, told, you know, leave this alone. Don't wear your jewelry. Don't wear jewelry. Don't wear, mm -mm, don't wear all that gold and rings and, and necklaces and all this stuff. You, know, you need to bring it on down somewhere. Don't wear any, okay? Bring it down. Tone it down. This is not the place but to wear your flashy stuff or to do whatever. You're on assignment, okay? You're on assignment. You're on assignment. You're on assignment. And you know, what we don't realize is that people are paying attention to everything that you're saying, everything you're doing. They're looking at you from your head to your toe. I can remember one time I went with Kairos uh, to the uh, ladies' facility up in, um, I think it's Jessup we went. And I can remember that I just had um, a couple of just plain wedding bands that I have that are just like $2 bands I got from just out the dollar store or something. You know, they look cute. And so I just wear them occasionally. You know what I'm saying? So I just put the band on. I had like three bands. I put them one on one day, one on another day, and the one the next day. And when I was eating lunch with one of the ladies at the cafeteria at the, at the prison, she said to me, she says, wow. She said, you have, you have different wedding bands? And I'm like, uh, yeah, I do. I said, but these, 
these are my favorite. They're from like the dollar store. That's what I, and she bust out. She was like, I can't believe you. I said, yeah, that's how, those are my favorite. Yeah. So, I mean, people will pay attention to you where you're going. You know, you think they're not paying attention, but they are. So always be on point when you're going to go where God is leading you to go. And, and then it goes on to say that whatever town or village you enter, search there for some worthy person and stay at their house until you leave. As you enter the home, give it your greeting. If the home is deserving, let your peace rest on it. If not, let your peace return to you. If anyone will not welcome you or listen to your words, leave that home or town and shake the dust off of your feet. Truly, I tell you, it will be more bearable for Sodom and Gomorrah on the day of judgment than for that town. Again, getting into the historical part of this, when they were sent to these different towns, the way that they were um, staying or residing, what they would do is they would ask people if they could stay at their house. And they say, peace be with you. And when they go there, they would use that as an opening statement to start talking about Jesus. If the people were welcoming of that, they would know this is a good place for me to stay. So when they would stay at their homes, they would talk about Jesus. They would talk about the goodness of God. And that's what their mission was all about, was going there, talking about Jesus, bringing the people into the fold. So when people, they met people that were not, about it and you and I have met people that don't want to hear anything about Jesus so when we find that out you know we need to just shake the dust off our feet but there's more to that text than this it's because of the region they were in why they said that it's because of the region that they're in and what the people believe there and what they did not believe and then when they meant shake the dust they, that was pretty much literally what they meant shake the dust off leave that dust there with them don't bring that back to where you're going and sometimes even now we have that same somewhat analogy with people wherein you don't want people trapping through your house with shoes on you don't know where they've been you want people to take their shoes off a lot of people uh take their shoes off when they enter their home which is a good thing because you're taking dust from outside even you don't know where your feet have been outside so all of that goes to play with a lot of the historical context of all of that and it went on to say if they listen you know if they if they're not welcome to you or listen to your words leave that home and towel shake the dust off your feet the common phrase that was made when entering a home was the salutation peace be unto you as they used it and it, was, uh, it turned into the gospel. People say that now, peace be unto you. And that was all from all of them going to enter these homes and uh, the historical part of all of that. Um, this become a gospel prayer uh, put, and it's been um, witnessed in the, as they were witnessing in the homes that was part of the gospel prayer for that. Uh, they, those that did not want them in their homes they would leave that to God because God knows the heart of every person. We cannot get into a, 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 a mode of no, uh, saying, oh, we're not going to witness to them and we're not going to witness to them. We're not going to witness because they're in a certain region or they're doing this. No, the Great Commission tells us to go ye all to all the nations. We can't pick and choose where to go everywhere and witness about Christ. So. The difference between then and now as we move forward with that text, uh, like I said, I got into the uh, historical part about it, but as we move forward into that text, then that text will show us how it changed with the Great Commission. They were doing the regions in the beginning of that text. When we started out and he called the disciples, they were doing regions. They were sent out in regions to cover those regions. But then at the end towards that text, it goes on in Matthew 28, where it talks about um, how we're to go to all nations. And I had put as point number seven, keep your peace. Don't let others disturb it. Favor best in your witness to those who receive it. When you witness to people and they receive it, that's a twofold favor. You have released what God has put into you, and you know you've released it. It's such a good feeling, but the person is receptive of it. 
and that will allow them to flourish and go on to be who God would have them to be. Um, this piece makes you want to share more. You find yourself staying more and more and more and more talking about the goodness of God. You and I know that we even do that on the parking lot sometimes. We can't seem to break away from each other because we're talking about the goodness of God and what he has done for each and every one of us. So he just goes on to say that. Then the other rest of the text goes on to talk about how I'm sending you like sheep among the wolves again. We are. We're sent out among people that may not know Christ, and, and we have to keep going. When we get to the opposition, know that we always have to obey God and keep it moving. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop right here at this text right here, and I'm going to say uh, the Great Commission, which was Matthew 28, 16 to, through 20, where it says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, and you can see how there's a transition from the beginning of Matthew in verse uh, chapter 10 down to 28, and we know that Judas was no longer on board then. It says, then the 11 disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshiped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Know that God is with you always to the very end of the age. He has equipped each and every one of you to be true disciples of Christ. Continue to study to show yourself approved. Continue to pray to him on a regular basis. Continue to do what God would have you to do by listening to his prompts, listening to his instructions, and following them through, even when you don't think it's a good time to do it. Just do it. Because obey God and keep it moving. Just keep obeying him and keep it moving. God bless you today. I'd like to open the doors of the church up. If there's anybody under the sound of my voice today um, or even online, if the online portion is still on, please. Um, if, you, if you don't know Christ as your Savior, this is your opportunity to do so. This is your opportunity to do so. If you would all stand, please. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. So give her a hug of love as she departs from this place. Thank you for coming out today. And I pray that the mission field that you heard about today is your everyday occurrence. At work, wherever you go, is your field until you depart from this land. Amen? So have a blessed day. Continue to lift up. Reverend Bernadette, where you go? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> All right. Thank you for that word today. Praise the Lord.